Oh, let's go live into the sanctuary. Welcome to the live service from Family Worship Center in Athens, Tennessee. We pray this program will be a tremendous blessing to you. Now, let's go live into the sanctuary. Night. And uh, she, she did like we did. She got out of Egypt. <laughs> she let you live in Athens now? Good. Amen. That's good. Praise the Lord. It's good to have her tonight with us. If you have your Bibles, I want you to go with us to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I think I have to have a little bit of help tonight with my eyes. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul writing says this. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ, and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in a demonstration of the spirit and of the power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And tonight I've titled this little message that the message that we preach is the title of it. The message that we preach. And if the Lord will help me tonight, I'm going to try to bring out some things uh, that I feel like the Lord has given me. Um, I feel like he laid this on my heart uh, three or four days ago. And actually, I, uh, Chris didn't know it, but yesterday we was coming back from the nursing home, and we, or we were on our way, and we were talking, and he was just making mention of some of these scriptures he'd been reading, and I didn't say anything to him. But I just took that as, you know, I, I knew uh, the Lord was still leading me in this direction because he was all over it. And I'd been studying it myself some and reading it. And so uh, we're just going to go with uh, that tonight, what I feel like the Lord's laid on my heart, the message that we preach. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and I'm asking that you would move tonight, that you would touch us, that you would help us, that you would open our understanding that the Holy Spirit that does all the work in our heart and in our lives, that he would do a work in our heart tonight, that you would open our eyes, open our ears, the spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears, as the book of Revelation says, to let us hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. Lord, I know what you're saying. You're taking us back to the foot of the cross. You're taking us back to your Son. And you're causing us to look to him for everything that we need. And God, I pray tonight that you help me to lift up your son, that he might be glorified, and that you would work in this place, move through those watching through the internet, Lord, those that will listen by later date. God, move those that will watch the messages, Lord, through YouTube. Lord, touch them, bless them, speak to them, God. Lord, save souls, deliver people from bondages, Lord, who need to be delivered, God. You have the power to do it. And, Lord, we believe it tonight. And we all say we agree together that it shall be done. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. The Apostle Paul, as you know, wrote, wrote, two-thirds of the New Testament, most of the New Testament. And sometimes, you know, uh, maybe we may tend to get accused of uh, talking about Paul too much. And, and in a sense, you know, that's, um, I, I want to say, yeah, guilty. Be and the reason I say that is, it's not to lift up one preacher above the other, but it was to the Apostle Paul that God gave, that God gave the understanding of the new covenant as it regards sanctification and how to live right on a daily basis. Church done Christians today, they don't know how to go on to live right on a daily basis. Many of them have been saved. Many people have been saved. But when it comes to sanctification and knowing how to continue on a daily basis and see themselves freed from the powers of darkness, they just don't know because we don't have enough preachers in this world preaching the gospel to point them to the truth. And Paul, when Paul founded this church in Corinth, it said that Corinth was a 
wicked, heathenistic, idolatrous city. That it was full of prostitution, uh, you know, full of debauchery, and all kind of wickedness. And it was a very prosperous city, too. And they, they, it seems that they had money. They had, uh, you know, they prospered in the financial realm. But the city was full of sin and full of sinners, just like the world is today. Just like Athens, Tennessee is. Just like the United States of America, every city in it, there are sinners. It's, the cities are full of people that are sinning, that are destroying themselves with their sin. And this, the sin was... Uh, it was, it was gross sin going on. And Paul, whenever he came to Corinth, he came for one reason, and that was to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because, as you hear Brother Swagger say, if it would work in Corinth, then it'll work anywhere. Jonah was sent to Nineveh, and he didn't want to go at first. Remember Jonah? You know the story of Brother Jonah. He really, when you get down to it, he really didn't want to see God do what God said he was going to do. And he gets on a ship going in the wrong direction, a man of God. And Nineveh was, God told him, said, I want you to preach to that wicked city. And go in and you tell them that in 40 days I'm going to overthrow the city if they don't repent. And a revival broke out. Man, people got saved at the preaching of Jonah. And afterwards, Jonah went and had a self-pity party like we all do at times. After a great move of God, he set up under a juniper tree, I think it was, and he had him a pity party. After God just moved in a mighty way. But if it would work in Corinth, if it would work in Nineveh, then it'll work in Athens, Tennessee. It'll work in any other town around, in every town around us, it'll work if the preachers will preach the right message. The only way people are going to be set free from sin is not through AA, not through a church psychiatrist. You got to get them to Jesus. You got to get them back to the foot of the cross. This works. It's real. And Paul, God, the Holy Spirit led Paul to this place because he had a mission for him. But see, before Paul got to this place, Paul already come to the revelation and the understanding that there is nothing that will set man free except for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Dr. Phil can't change you. Oprah's way won't fix you. Dr. Oz can't fix you. You need Dr. Jesus. And so he knew, well, the Lord knew what he wanted to do by sending Paul into this city to preach the gospel. And so Paul comes into Corinth, and a church is established, as you know it, as the church of Corinth, the Corinthian church. And, and you know what? Guess what happens? Paul goes into the town. He comes in looking for every opportunity he can to preach the gospel, and souls begin to get saved. People's lives begin to be changed. Prostitutes begin to be made holy. People stop drinking. They stop cursing. They stop arousing with the women and everything. They stop it. It all stops. When you get saved, your life changes. It's supposed to. Unless you just got religion, unless you just got baptized, Amen. water baptism won't do anything for you. It won't change a wicked heart. That's why Paul said that Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Every preacher needs to know that. They need to learn that. God didn't send us to put emphasis upon things that does not bring a change in a man's life. Because they can dunk you till you about drown, and you're going to come up still bound by sin until you be plunged into the blood of God's Son, until you come to the foot of Calvary and say, Jesus, Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I need to be saved, and I place my faith in what you have done, and I accept you, and I make you my Lord and my Savior. At that very moment, 
gentlemen, the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. At that very moment, your whole world can change. But preachers don't believe this. Most churches don't believe this. Because if to believe this means you've got to get the foolishness out of your church. It means you've got to get, your, get the programs that don't do any good. You've got to get them out. You've got to get the psychiatrist out of your house. You've got to get the drugs out of your house because the drugs can't fix you. That's just a temporary fix. They just ease, you know, pain temporary. Alcohol just eases, disease is pain temporary. But when it all wears off, you're right back where you started. And it's a never-ending cycle that will destroy our heart and lives. But God gave us an answer for sin. And Paul, God sent Paul into this city. And as he began to preach the gospel, the power of God started moving and people's lives began to be changed. And so when this church was founded, this church was founded upon the right foundation. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse uh, um, 23, 24, on down through there? He says, Whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon the rock. And when the winds come and the rains descended and it did beat upon that house, that house did not fall because it was founded upon the rock. Let me tell you tonight, Jesus is the rock. He is the chief cornerstone. He is the foundation of everything, my friend. It's the blood of God. God's son, that is the foundation of, um, upon which everything we get tonight, it comes because of that foundation. And if we're not building on that foundation, we're like a foolish man. We're building a house on the sand. And when the wind comes, and when the wind, honey, it's coming. And when the storm comes, and when the devil comes, and when sin comes, you're going to find out what it is you really have. And those that don't build their house upon this rock and keep their faith in the finished work of the cross on a daily basis, they're like a foolish man. They're building their house on sand. And every time a big puff of wind comes, whew, every time a storm comes, whew, every time the rain comes, they get flooded out. And their foundation that's built upon psychology and psychiatry and 40 days of purpose and three days of this and two days of that. It all gets washed out from under them and they find themselves looking around saying, oh my Lord, what have I done? Because if your faith is in anything other than God's Son, what He did at the cross daily, not just when you got saved, now, in the morning, the next day. Then you're going to be building your house upon sand. And when that test comes, Jesus says, that house, not only does that house fall, but that house falls, it's, it's a great fall. It suffers much destruction and everything is taken out. And that person has no hope. But we have hope. We have hope. Those who build their house upon the rock. Psalm says that he that, he that builds his house, that in likening this, that he's like a tree. Psalm chapter 1, I think it is. He's like a tree planted by the rivers of water whose leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he doth shall prosper. What does he mean? Let me tell you something. The tree that is planted where there's a steady source of water flowing by, the Holy Spirit, my friend, is your steady source. And when the tree is planted because of the foundation of God's Son, we're the tree. 
Okay, we're you supposed to be planted tonight, my friend. You're planted in something. And if you're planted by the rivers of living water and your faith is in the finished work of Jesus Christ, your leaf, your fruit is not going to wither, honey, but you're going to bear fruit when everybody else don't have no fruit. Oh, somebody ought to hear me tonight. You're going to be bearing fruit while the rest of the trees around, they're falling down. They've fallen into the river. They're washed up. They're gone. But you might be an, you might, might even be an old, big, fat tree, honey, hanging by the bank, baby. But the tree, the water of life flows under your roots, and your roots go way down deep. I said they go way down deep. And when the storm comes, and storm comes. I said when the storm comes and it tries to knock your tree down and your tree might even go down but because the roots go way down deep that thing springs right back up. Woo. Your tree is supposed to be planted by the river of water. Jesus Christ and his sacrifices where we're planted and the Holy Spirit comes and waters. He brings, he is the water. He is the water of life. And as long as you stay planted where you're supposed to be planted, the water flows. And when everybody else around you is falling, you're standing. When you got family backsliding, you're standing. When you got kids strung out on drugs, you're standing. When you got people that don't want to talk to you anymore, you're standing. Because you're planted by the river of water. You're planted in Jesus Christ. This is the only way that we're going to stand. This is what Paul preached, and this is what this church was founded upon. These people's lives were changed. But knowing the devil, he always shows up somewhere down the road. And he showed up to the church of Corinth a little later on. And he comes through false teachers. He comes through those who carry Bibles. He comes through those who wear nice suits, who drive nice cars, who have big ministries, thousands of followers, television ministries. He comes... And what he does is he starts diverting the people's attention from what Jesus Christ has done, and then he starts getting the people's eyes on men. Well, who's your favorite preacher? This is what they were doing. Paul said, I beseech you by the mercy of God. He said, let, let, let me read some of it to you because I don't want to misquote it to you. Let me just back up real quick. He said, let me find it, let me find it, let me find it. He said, it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them that are of the household of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. There were divisions that had crept into this church. He said, I beseech you by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same thing. Not speaking the same thing or, or, you know, imitating one another, but everybody believing the right message which will produce the right speaking. You all need to get back to speaking the same thing. The problem is we got our eyes off of Jesus and we got our eyes on men and ministries and personalities and baptismal formulas. He said, I don't want there to be any divisions amongst you. So the knowledge came to him. Word came to Paul that this church was in trouble, that there was a division arising in the church that Paul started. Imagine that. A division in the church, a true church. Yeah, if you're looking for a perfect church, you can forget it. Who do you think Satan... It's going to try to divide. The Mormons? No. The Jehovah's Witnesses? No. He wants them all to be in perfect unity because he has them deceived. 
Who does he want to divide? He wants to divide all those God-loving, Jesus-fearing saints of God that believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that through the blood of his covenant we have salvation, we have healing, we have deliverance from sin, everything we need, he wants to divide us. And that's what he did in this church. He comes in and he starts using people, as he usually does, he uses people to bring division. And so the division was centered uh, around this. Preachers, men, personalities. They were saying, well, I'm of Paul. You know, this group, see, they were splitting into groups. One group says, we're of Paul. Another group says, well, we're of Apollos. Another group says, well, we're of Cephas. And then the last group says, well, we don't need Paul. We don't need Cephas, and we don't need Apollos. We just got Jesus. We don't need to go to church. We just got Jesus. We don't need to learn anything. We just got Jesus. We don't need Paul's ministry. We got Peter. And they started getting their eyes on men. And it all becomes about who's the greatest preacher. And Satan diverts the Christian's focus when that happens. And so Paul says this. He asked them a question. He says, hey, is Christ divided? Is Jesus Christ divided into segments? Is he a Baptist Jesus and a Methodist Jesus and a Pentecostal Jesus and a Presbyterian? No. No. When you get to heaven, it's not going to be Baptist and Methodist and Pentecostals and Presbyterians. We're all going to be one. Matter of fact, right now, we're all, Paul said in Galatians, we all are now supposed to be all one in Christ. There's neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, but we're all one in Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be because he is the head. And he is, that's why we all have unity. That's why we can have fellowship with one another because we believe the right message. We believe that it's through God's Son and what he did at Calvary that we have salvation and we have everything we need. And we go on to be sanctified on a daily basis because of our faith in that. So is Christ divided? I don't think so. And then Paul says this. He says, was Paul crucified for you? Was your pastor crucified for you? Some people act like he was. No. It was Jesus Christ who was crucified. And then he goes on after that to correct another error that they were off in. See, now it switches from that to that to water baptism. Then they start boasting about who's baptized who. What formula did you get? baptized in how many have you baptized in your church it's not about how many you're baptizing it's about how many are getting saved because the baptism comes afterwards and it doesn't matter whether whether I baptize them or you baptize them Paul said he couldn't even remember who he baptized just a few people because he didn't want anybody's eyes on him. He didn't want to be lifted up as though he was some great thing. And so he couldn't, he said there was only a few people that he even baptized. And the point is, water baptism has nothing to do with your salvation. It's an outward testimony of what's already taking place inwardly. That's all it is. It doesn't make you any cleaner. It doesn't set you free from sin. They can sprinkle holy water on you. You can get through the prayer line, and you can, have them to, you can have them to flip it on you. You can get the holy oil out that they say is from Jerusalem and dump it all over your head and do a, a two-step and twirl and fall out in the, on the floor. But when you get up, if your faith is not in what God's Son has done at the cross, you're going to walk out that door, and you're going to be the same person you was when you walked into that meeting, and nothing will be changed. I know because I've been through some of them. 
Anybody ever bought the shirt? You tried it. It don't work. But I found out what works. I know what works. It's kept me for 16 years. It works. It hasn't come easy, but it works. And it's the only thing that's going to keep us. I mean, it's looking at that, our sister Nancy back there, and I was so happy to see her face come through that door. To see her. And to think about, you know, the times that we had Bible studies together and how we always tried to stick to Jesus Christ. It looks like she's still sticking with Jesus Christ. And I'm sure she probably got some stories to tell that, that's happened since we've seen the last time. But we've all, we've all bit off the stupid. We've all been through the prayer lines. We've all gave the money hoping that something would change when the preacher laid his hands on us, but it don't work. It's a gimmick. And it's all formulated by Satan to get your money and to rob you of your victory. Pre I mean, they're, they're by the multitudes over television. The things that preachers come up with and offer to people is silly. And they make these big promises to the people because they want the money. They're too in love with the money. You know how many preachers... They're so deep in now with the money that they have to continue with the gimmicks to keep the ministry going because they can't step back and repent and preach the word of God and believe that God will meet their needs and grow their church and do it the way he wants to do it. It's not about how many people are sitting in your church. It's about the growth on the inside of those people. Are those people growing? Are they being set free from bondage? So he says... He, did, he, didn't, he couldn't even remember who he baptized. You can, you can read it later on from verse 16 or 14 uh, through 16. He tells us, it's not about water baptism. Because he said, Christ didn't send me to baptize. But to preach the gospel, he said in verse 17, he didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. I'm not sent to baptize people. I'm sent to preach the God. I'm not sent to, to put the emphasis upon baptizing people. Yes, we baptize people at times, but that's not where the emphasis is to be. When you go to baptize somebody, you need to make sure before you take somebody out into a water tank or a lake or anywhere else, you better make sure, my friend, if water baptism is an outward ceremony of what's already taking place inside, you better make sure it's already taking place on the inside before you start trying to go through with it on the outside because if you don't, you're going to mislead somebody and make them think they're saved because you took them down in some water. In verse 18, Paul says this. He said, for the preaching of the cross. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. The world laughs at this. People drive up and down this road and see these cars sitting in this parking lot tonight and laugh. And they think we're foolish. If they only knew. I used to think the same thing. Until Jesus got a hold of my life. It's foolishness to them. A man dying on a cross, a Jew, the Son of God, you claim, dying on a cross and shedding his blood. You're telling me that if I believe in that and I put my faith in it, that my life can change? That is exactly what I'm telling you. For the preaching of the cross. That is who Jesus is and what Jesus come to do. We're not talking about his miracles. We're not talking about him opening blinded eyes. That's all good. That's all important. But the greatest thing Jesus ever did was save my soul and set me free from the powers of darkness. It's why Paul said, he said, for the preaching of the cross. This is what preachers are supposed to, supposed to be preaching. This is what we're all supposed to be preaching. This is what every church in this town, if it's truly called of God, should be preaching this message. But how many are? Hardly none at all. They're full of gimmicks. They're full of formulas. 
They're full of programs. Come celebrate recovery. I don't have to celebrate your recovery, honey. I recovered all when I got saved. I've been celebrating ever since I got saved, Brother Chris. I've been celebrating for 16 years. I'm not uh, still an alcoholic. I used to be. And I'm not going out. How dare me slap God in the face and stand up and say, Well, I'm still an alcoholic. And we're, no, I don't think so, honey. Jesus set me free. He changed my life. So why, are we, why do we go through these things? Because it appeals to our flesh. And it makes churches look good. See, if they can glory in our flesh... Paul talked about in Galatians that these, these Judaizers, these men that are steeped in religion, they love the praises of men more than they do the praises of God. They love their formulas. They love their traditions. They love their programs. These men are so steeped in this. And if they can get anybody to come into their little club and put them through their program and, and it looks like it might help them, they say, hey, 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 see what we did? See, they're all our disciple, they went through, oh, no, honey, ain't no flesh going to glow in God's presence, my friend. If anything's going to be done in your heart, it's going to be because of the man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. If anything's going to be done in my life, ain't no man going to get no glory, brother. Whatever is done in this church, ain't no man going to get no glory. Ain't no denomination getting any glory, because I ain't tied to no denominations, honey. I'm tied to to the head of the church, the firstborn from the dead. His name is God's Son, King of kings and Lord of lords. And they want her glory. And Paul said in Galatians 5.11, he said, If I cease to preach the cross, when we cease to preach the cross, the offense of the cross stops. When we stop believing this message and we stop preaching it, all opposition comes to a halt. There is no persecution in 40 days of purpose. There is no persecution in water baptismal formulas. There is no persecution in traditions of men and men's programs, but honey, there is all hell to pay when you take up your cross and you start following the Son of the living God. And Paul said, if I, if I cease to preach the cross, he says, then is the offense of the cross ceased. He says, that's why they don't preach it. Because it brings suffering and persecution. And that's the very proof that they don't preach it. The cross is an offense. Putting your faith in what Jesus Christ has done and denying yourself, it will bring opposition. But that's okay. He'll bring you through the opposition. He'll bring you through the apostate church. He'll bring you through family members turning on you. He'll bring you through losing your job. He'll bring you through losing your home. He'll bring you through anything if you put your faith in him and you keep it there. If it worked in Corinth, it'll work in Athens, Tennessee. It is working in Athens, Tennessee. There's testimonies in this church. There's people in this church that are proof of what this message has done in your life. Whether it be what you've learned here or what you've learned through SBN or those that are truly preaching it, you've got a testimony of what it's done in your life. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but he said, unto we that are saved, it is the power of God. And that the emphasis there is upon the, us that, that those that are being saved insinuates those of us that are continuing to be saved. Meaning we're continuing to be changed. Oh, and I don't need nothing changed. Really? That's funny. Jeremiah said that the heart was desperately wicked. Who can know it? You don't even know your own heart. 
You don't even, we, we don't even see some of the things in our heart right now that are black and ugly. And the only reason God hasn't took judgment upon us is because our faith is in the one who already took the judgment upon himself. So he sees no iniquity or perverseness in Jacob. Amen. That's why Jesus ever liveth to make intercession for us. He's seated by the right hand of the Father right now. The fact that Jesus Christ, do you know what happened when Jesus died and ascended back to heaven? When he was crucified, when he was buried, and when he was resurrected, and when he ascended back to heaven, the Bible says he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God on majesty and on high. Do you know what that means? The priest under the old covenant, under the law, were always busy going in and out of tabernacles, in and out, offering up lambs, cutting the throats of innocent animals, pot blood being poured out for the sins of the people. But the scripture says that the blood of bulls and of goats cannot take away sins. They were a type of the Son of God, the Lamb of God, and the priests were busy going in, going out, carrying out sacrifices. They never had any rest because under law, that's all law does. It puts a burden on you. There is no rest. But Jesus, this man, after he would have died on the cross, he ascended to the throne of God and he sat down on the right hand of God, meaning it is all done. There is rest in me. And if you look to him, my friend, he sat down. It means he, he sat down. He means, okay, it's done. It's done. And Paul said, listen, that's the, here's the best part. Paul said, we are seated with him in heavenly places tonight, honey. I'm in him. And Jesus said, I'm in you and you're in me and I'm in the Father. You just don't know where you're sitting at tonight, honey, because it is finished. And the very fact that he sits in the presence of God says we have access now because of what he did at the cross. Because under the law, the animal blood couldn't take away sins. Hebrews is full of it. It tells us all about it. But after this man, after he offered himself for a sacrifice, purged our sins, and sat down at the right hand of God. It's all finished. And so there's no need for you to have to slave yourself and labor and try to quote scripture and try to read an extra five chapters a day and pray 30 minutes longer to try to free yourself from something in your life that you need freedom from. It's already been done. Look to him. Yes, we do those things. We read our Bible. We pray. We do, but we do it because we're in a relationship with him, not because we're trying to get him to do something in us. He does his work in us because we put our faith in what he's already done for us. This is what Paul preached. This is what Paul taught. And so when we come to chapter 2 in our text tonight, in verse 1, he says this. This is my introduction. I'm just getting started. Y'all ready? Nancy, you come at a good night. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, what is he saying? When I came to you, brethren, don't you remember when God sent me to you into Corinth to preach the gospel and this church was founded? When I came to you, he says, I did not come with excellency of speech or of wisdom. What does that mean? Excellency of speech means a, it, it, that word excellency, excellency actually speaks of a superior attitude. He thinks he's above everybody else, like a lot of preachers. It, it also, one of the definitions is pre, preeminence. Paul didn't conduct himself like that. He said, when I came to you, I didn't come to you with a superior attitude or a preeminent attitude. But when I came to you and founded this church, 
He said, I didn't come to you with excellency of speech. And it wasn't how I said something. Or of wisdom. Why? Because the Corinthian church was gloating in human wisdom. Television is full of them, preachers, who boast in their so-called wisdom. There's one he has, I don't know how many wisdom keys he has now, but eight or ten years ago he had so many wisdom keys he couldn't keep up with them. And it's all wisdom of a man. The fear of God is true wisdom, the Bible says. But he says, I didn't come to you with excellency of speech or wisdom. Had claiming a higher knowledge or put himself on a level above everybody else. Or with worldly wisdom. He didn't use, he didn't use the tactics of the world to get people saved. He didn't go to the local hangout where the fornicating was going on and the debauchery and the drinking and gather everybody together and say, well, I'm going to stay here with y'all and I'll win y'all to Christ. No. Jesus didn't do it either. Jesus came to people on Jesus' terms. When Jesus came to, it was into the Pharisee's house, I think it might have been Nicodemus, he came on his terms. Jesus didn't go, if Jesus were here today, see, we got messed up thinking. Jesus would not be walking into a nightclub and sitting on the chair at the nightclub drinking beer with the people that are drunk to try to get them to come to him. That is not the Jesus of the Bible. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, 2 Corinthians 6, 14. What fellowship has light with darkness? We have been lied to. We have, and, and you know what? You've got to be careful, folks, because this is a seducing spirit. And all it's there for is to try to get you to pull you back into a former lifestyle. Who in the world would be stupid enough? Look, I've been saved for 16 years. I was an alcoholic before I got saved. I'd never one time been into a bar. God's never one time go, told me, go down to the local bar. I'll tell you why. Because you're not going to win people to Jesus when they're in their drunken state. Hello? Why do you think they're at the bar? Away from God. Oh, come on, anybody. Anybody who used to drink? To go drown themselves out because they don't want God. They push themselves away. That's why they're where they're at. And we've got this thinking. You know, we're told in today's church, oh, well, you get saved and you can just come on, go into the world and be just like them and you can be a testimony. No, you can't. You got to come out from among them. You got to let them see something changed in you. Amen. These so called churches, they go in the bar and call it beer, suds, and Jesus. God have mercy on your soul. But we live in a day and age where, oh, it's okay, just a little bit. That's the same lie Satan told Eve. The same lie he's passed down all through centuries. Just a little bit. Well, that's true. That's how I started off drinking. Just a little bit. That's how some of us start off smoking cigarettes, ain't it? We just want to try it, didn't we? Want to be cool. And before we know it, we're smoking a pack a day. Well, some of us might have been two or three. I didn't go that far. I went to a pack. But I know people have smoked. I mean, I know, I knew chain smokers. I mean, put one out and light another one right back up. I said, my Lord. I thought I was bad. And we're told you can just stay like you are. 
It's not what the Bible says. If it changed these people's lives, why won't it change ours? And so, the gospel today that most are preaching, it's not bringing a change in people's lives. If it's telling you that you can be just like the world, it's not going to bring a change in your life. And most so-called churches, they, they're not churches because they're just like the world. They're social clubs. If this is not going on in the church, if somebody is not getting behind a pulpit and preaching this message and being led by the Spirit, nobody's life is going to be changed. He said, I didn't come to you with excellency of speech or wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. You know what Paul did? He didn't come to delve in philosophies of men and human wisdom. He came to be a witness for Jesus Christ and to lift him up and to preach him. He said, I didn't come to you with excellence in speech, speech or wisdom. He said, but when I came to you, I came to you declaring unto you the testimony of God. What is the testimony of God? It's very simple. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is the testimony of God. His son crucified. Paul said, I came to you with the testimony of God. He said, hey, church. Hey, people, listen to me. You that have allowed yourself to have, to have your focus diverted, listen to me. Let me get your attention. Don't you remember back in the beginning whenever I came to the city, what I preached? Don't you remember the change that it brought in your life? You need to get back to speaking the same thing. Declaring unto you. He said, I came declaring to you the testimony of God. And in verse 2, he says this. He said, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. What does that mean? He's saying Paul's attention was not concentrated upon things, upon but one thing, and that was to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to exclude everything else. Determine. Here's what the word determine means. It means, it says this, a definition, to judge in one's own mind as to what is right, to separate, to distinguish, to know the difference between something. What, what is he saying? I believe this is what Paul is saying when he said, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that word also means to see. I determined not to know. The word to know means, actually, I looked the definition up, it means to see, to know. I've determined Meaning, he's already judged in his own mind that there's only one thing that works. Now, if I'm writing this, and I think I am, I think I know how Paul come to this conclusion. If you go back to Romans chapter 7, if you go to Romans 7, go there with me real quick. Let's look at it. We just have a little Bible study tonight. We ain't in no hurry, are we? Romans 7 Look at this. I want to show you how I believe that Paul come to this conclusion. It's known as the Christian struggle. We see it as Paul's struggle, but I guarantee you every one of us find ourselves in this scenario somewhere in our Christian life. This is Paul struggling with a sin in his life. We're not told what it is, but we're just told by Paul himself that there was something in his life that he could not get victory over. After being saved, after coming to Jesus. In verse 
15, he says this, For that which I do, I allow not, means, he, the word allow means to understand. He says, that which I do, I don't understand why it is I'm doing it. There's something wrong in the man's life. He said, for that I would, I do not. He says, that the, the thing that I want to do and to please God, I don't have the ability and I don't find out how to please God. He said, but what I hate, that do I. That's not coming from an unsaved man. That's coming from somebody who's saved and hates what they're doing. It's hurting them. It's harming them. And he's crying out for help. And in verse uh, 16, look, he says, If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. 17, now then it is no more I that do it, but it is sin that dwells in me. Paul tells us he has a problem, and he realizes that the problem that he has is that this, this force that is overcoming his will and pushing him to do something that is ungodly and wrong, he doesn't have the strength within himself to change it, and he doesn't understand it, but he does know this. He knows it has something to do with a sin nature because every one of us are born with a sin nature and but what every one of us don't understand when we get saved at the moment we get saved when we accept Jesus according to Romans 6 3 and 4 at that moment we are spiritually baptized into Jesus Christ his death was our death his burial is our burial his resurrection is our resurrection and we are united with him in everything he did in a spiritual sense and that is where the power of the sin nature was broke remember all the joy when you got saved Remember the happiness? Remember the cloud nine experience? You didn't ever think you were going to leave it? And you couldn't wait to get out to tell somebody about this Jesus? You accepted how he changed your life and set you free? Remember how good you felt? Do you know why? Because at that moment when you were saved, you were baptized into Jesus Christ. And you were placed into him. But what happens is, because... We don't have proper teaching. I didn't have proper teaching after I was first saved. We didn't have it. So we had to stumble around for a little while. And when things started rising in our heart and lives, and we love God, and we find ourselves having to repent over it, and we get on our knees, and we pray real hard, and we say, okay, God, and we ask him to forgive us, and he does, because 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But because we don't understand that spiritual position we have in him, we get up off the floor and we say, okay, God, I'll never do that again. Only to find out we did it again. Hello? I never do that again. And just to make sure that I never do it again, I'm going to read two extra chapters a day. I'm going to pray hard. I'm going to get to that meeting. I'm going to do this. And, I'm going to, and we don't understand we are committing spiritual adultery. We're telling Jesus that what he did at the cross wasn't really enough to bring the change we need and to set us free. So we set out to try to change ourselves. There's never been one who's never done this. And so Paul is saved here. He says, the thing I hate, I'm doing it. But I don't understand why. But he knows. And, and then, of course, the Holy Spirit is the one who shows Paul the answer. So he's crying out in desperation. In verse 20, he says, now if I do that that I don't want to do... He said, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Look at verse 22. He said, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. 23. But I see another law in my members. This is the law of sin and death. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Proof that Satan can override 
your will outside of your faith in God's Son. 2 Timothy 2.26 proves it. That Satan takes captive those at his own will who ignore God's way and allow themselves to be pulled out of the way. In the verse 24, he says this, O wretched man that I am, O God, O my goodness, I'm wretched. This thing, Lord, is sickening. This thing, Lord, is hurting me. This thing, Lord, is killing me spiritually. Oh, wretched man that I am. He says, who, who, not what, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now, at the time Paul wrote this, he wasn't struggling with this. He wrote this to tell us about his experience. And the moment he cries, who? God says, okay, i show you who. He went on to say in the next phrase, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. God, the Holy Spirit, brings him right back to the Son of God, right back to the foot of the cross. You struggling tonight? You got something that causes you to say, Oh, wretched man that I am, what am I going to do? I got good news for you tonight, honey. Come back to the foot of the cross, and God's Son will show up and deliver you. Amen. Now, why did I say all that? I said all that to get back to this. Paul said, I determined... I made up my mind. I've already judged it because I've already been through it. Hello? He says, I'm determined. I'm not going to preach anything, brother. I'm not telling anybody, anybody that's got a problem in my assembly, in my church, I am determined. I ain't giving them 40 days of purpose. I'm not giving them psychology. I'm not giving them human wisdom. I'm determined not to know anything but Jesus Christ and him crucified because that is the power of God. So Paul had to come to the conclusion himself, just like we all do. Don't we all have to have a Romans 7 experience before we can really learn this? Don't we all have to find ourselves at somewhere in our Christian life saying, oh, wretched man that I am. Not oh, wretched man that he is. Oh, wretched man that I am. And then God gave Paul the answer. Back to the cross. You got a problem tonight? Come back to where Jesus gave his life. Because he didn't just die to save you. He died to give you freedom from ongoing sin. 1 John 3, 7, 8 says, He that committed sin is of the devil... For the devil sinneth from the beginning. That's original sin that come into this world when Adam and Eve fell. But for this purpose was the Son of God manifested that he came, that he might destroy the works of the devil, break the power of sin in our lives. We don't have to be bound. We don't have to be in bondage to that thing that, is, that Satan tries to use to destroy us. We can have freedom from it. He said in Romans 6, 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, because you're not under law, but you're under grace. If you're under grace, sin doesn't have dominion over you. But if you're under law, if you're trying to free yourself through your own method, then sin is going to dominate you. The sin nature is going to take an occasion in Romans 7, 6. Take occasion. Sin takes occasion by the commandment, by turning to law and putting our trust in self and I won't. 
I shall not. I'm moral. I won't do this. I'm not as bad as him. I keep that commandment. I break that one, but I keep this one. And if you break one, you've broken them all. And so Paul says, I determine not to know anything among you. Not to know. Now whether that means to see or to know, to see in the spiritual realm, if you want to look at it like that, he's saying, you know what? I don't see anything else except Jesus Christ and him crucified as the answer for your problem. And I'm determined not to know. I'm determined not to to preach anything except Jesus. What are you saying, Thomas, that every time you get in the pulpit, you got to say cross? No, that's not what I'm saying. You're saying every time you get in a pulpit, you got to say, preach this same message? That's not what I'm saying. Every message I preach had better be founded on this. This better be my foundation. This was what Paul was saying. He says, you know what? I've already made up my mind. And that's why Paul covered a variety of subjects. Amen. He didn't just deal with sanctification. Amen. It's the most important. Don't misunderstand me. But that's the same Paul that preached on the rapture. Amen. That's the same Paul that preached on separation. Hello? That's the same Paul that preached on spiritual baptism. I mean, Paul, he covered a variety of subjects. But the most important is sanctification, how to live right. This is the message that we preach. There's nothing else to preach. And sad to say, when a preacher makes up his mind, he's going to stand on this and preach this, he'll lose some and he'll gain some. This is why preachers all over the world, preachers, denominational preachers that have been hearing this truth, this message through SBN and through other avenues, they've heard this and now they have to make a decision, but they won't make the decision because they know it will cost them something. The hardest thing for a preacher to do is let God start all over. And if you lose them all, God will give you another platform. And then God will give you the right people. He'll give you the people that want the truth. But how many preachers, they can't repent. They won't leave their denomination because they know it'll bring trouble. Paul said, I made up my mind. I don't care what the rest of you do. I'm going to preach it. I've determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Let me read the next few verses and I'll shut up. He said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. This message doesn't lift you up in pride. It doesn't puff you up. It puts a fear in your soul. The preacher called to preach this. He's going to face more hell than, he, than any apostate preacher ever thought about facing. And he's going to have to have an attitude of dependency upon the Lord 24-7. Understand, every time he gets up to preach, he's got to have God's help. So that he doesn't mislead people. He doesn't get off in areas that are wrong and get off in the flesh. I want to preach what God wants. I want what the Spirit of God wants. And it's going to cause us to have to be weak spiritually to depend upon him. But this is the same Paul that says, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Verse 4, he said, My speech and my preaching was not with, here's another good word, enticing words of men's wisdom. Enticing means persuasive. How many ministries spend their whole ministry just trying to persuade people to come to their church? to come to their group, to come to their program. Just trying to not persuading people to come to Jesus. 
just trying to influence people to come to them. Paul didn't do that. I don't think it bothered him one way or the other if they come to him or not. He was going to preach it straight up. Verse 4, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. He said, but it was in a demonstration of the spirit and of the power. Do you know what happened when Paul preached? The Holy Spirit showed up. People got saved. Their lives were changed. They were made free from sin. And I, and I have no doubt that there were manifestations of the Spirit of God in Paul's services. I'll guarantee you there were people getting happy. There were people laying hands on one another at times. They were speaking in other tongues. You couldn't convince me of no different, my friend, because this is the same Paul that wrote to the same church in chapter 13 about the gifts of the Spirit and said, I would to God that you all speak with tongues. Verse 5. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. There, there it is. Your faith is not supposed to be in men. Your faith is not supposed to be in the wisdom of men. And baptismal formulas, 40 days of purpose, 3 days of this, blowing shofars, putting prayer shawls over your head. Your faith is not to be in that stuff. That your faith should not rest in the wisdom of men, but your faith is to stand in the power of God. God's power comes because we put our faith in God's Son and what He did at Calvary and the Holy Spirit flows in us and He changes us on a daily basis. That's why we preach this message. Because it changes people's hearts and lives. Stand to your feet if you would. I want you to give me a song if you have something ready. And I want you, everybody, if you would, to bow your head, close your eyes. I want to pray, and I'm going to open the altar just for a minute. Lord, I'm asking you, God, right now that you move in this place. Lord, let your spirit come. Lord, I know that you've spoken to hearts tonight. <laughs> and Lord, I pray right now that those watching, those in this place tonight who need liberated, they've heard the word, they've heard the truth. And Lord, I pray tonight, Lord, that you touch people listening, watching, that need to be set free, that Lord, this truth has been made so real to them tonight, so plain, and that they'd make up their mind they're going to come back to their first love. And while she begins to play the song, as she go ahead and start it, if, look, if you need something tonight, doesn't matter what it is, we don't, nobody needs to know, don't want to know, God knows. If you want to come to the altar just for a few minutes and there's something you need to let God do in your heart, you want somebody to pray for you, they will. And the Lord will touch you tonight. Is there something that you need? the Spirit of God to do in your heart tonight. You said He comes in a demonstration of the power of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come. He's here already. And when we step out in faith, God says, okay, here I come. If you need a touch tonight, there's something you need, I want you to come. Don't look to man. Look to God. Praise God. Stop looking to men and start looking to God. You got a problem tonight. You got a financial need. Let me tell you, God can meet your financial need. Jesus Christ can meet every need that we have tonight. Just look to Jesus tonight. There's not a problem. There's not a mountain that God cannot move. Glory to God. <laughs> praise God. Come on, church. Begin to praise Him. Let me in. Come on, praise Praise God. God cannot do that. We pray you were blessed by this live service from Family Worship Center in Athens, Tennessee. Join us for our live services held Sunday morning at 11 a.m., Sunday evening at 6 p.m., Wednesday evening at 7 p.m., and our Saturday morning Bible study at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. 
If this program has been a blessing to you, or if you have any questions, please visit our website at www.fwc-tn.com.